Hi, everybody. This is Al Filreis. I'm not, sadly, at the Kelly Writer's House, nor is anyone you're looking at at the Writer's House, but we're our, the Writer's House is in our head, and I'm only about eight blocks from it. Um, this is Kelly Writer's House Fellows, and the first thing we need to do right now, and also it'll be the last at the beginning and at the end, is thank Gabrielle Hamilton, who is a Writer's House Fellow this semester. Exactly. There's applause happening. Applause. Um, we have spent the day with Gabrielle and we'll be back tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. again for a conversation. So tonight is tonight is a sort of reading plus, you know, passages plus Q&A. Um, and then tomorrow will be a Q&A, some questions from me, conversation, and then questions from you, those who join us by YouTube. And Lily Applebaum, whom I'm about to praise and then introduce, will be conveying questions from YouTube tomorrow from the YouTube chat over to our special Zoom chat. And from there, um, we will uh, convey some of the questions to Gabrielle. So come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. The aforementioned Lily Applebaum is the coordinator of Writer's House Fellows, Kelly Writer's House Fellows. I have said this many times and Lily maybe is stopping the belief in it because I always repeat it. She is the best, capital B-E-S-T, the best. Lily, thank you so much for another season of Writer's House Fellows. I mean, what can we say? It was not the season of Fellows we anticipated in terms of being remote, but it certainly has been wonderful. It absolutely has been. And we, this afternoon, those of you watching tonight won't know this, but I'll say it, this afternoon we had a long session with the students in the Writer's House Fellow Seminar. And Gabrielle, I don't even think we, I don't even think we asked you this. You voluntarily said, next year I want to come and be there in the house. And I think you even offered to cook, which is, I'm saying this in front of everybody. So it's kind of got to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to Gabrielle in a second. But first, Lily wants to, she has a little thing to do and she's going to introduce Devin who's here who is going to introduce Gabrielle so it's kind of going around in circles. <laughs> Lily Applebaum what do you have to say for yourself? Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's tuning in tonight who might watch the recording of this program um, in the future and anyone who's been with us for the other fellows readings in the series um, you know that Usually we are so excited to be able to provide a piece of letterpress printed ephemera, something that you can um, take home with you that has a piece of the program um, printed, uh, you know, uh, some of the work of the fellows printed on it. And so um, we do have a special Gabrielle Hamilton postcard. Um, a postcard, old fashioned postcard. A real old fashioned postcard and I will old fashionedly mail it to you, to your actual home. Wait, let me get this straight. You're gonna put a stamp on an envelope and you're gonna put a postcard in the envelope and mail it to someone who will then have to figure out what a postcard stamp costs and mail it out. <laughs> That's right. Or maybe you, know, maybe you frame it and you know hang it up as art. Maybe you tack it to a cork board, you know, far be it for me to say, but um, so if you are interested in receiving a Gabrielle Hamilton postcard mailed to your house, um, I will be putting the email address for that in the YouTube chat, but it's um, the fellow's writing address. So whfellow at writing.upen.edu. And um, we'll actually be discussing the passage that's printed on the postcard later, I think. What does the right postcard after? say? It's it's letterpress printed. This is hand, hand to, uh, printed. You want me to read? I, I'm well, not going to read this when we have Gabrielle reading well, she, later. It turns out Gabrielle's actually going to read it as part of a passage that she's reading. So go ahead. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the passage we printed, it says, um, this is the crepe. This is the cider. This is how we live and eat. So there's a little postcard sized message uh. for you. Um, you'll get much better context and a much better vocalization of that passage in a moment. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for tuning in. Send an email if you'd like that postcard. Um, I'll be in the YouTube chat and I'll also, um, as Al said, be collecting questions for tomorrow's 11 a.m. reading. So hope you'll come back um, and tune in for that. And I think that's all I have to say. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Devin Inman, who is the senior in our Writer's House Fellows Seminar. 
and he will be giving Gabrielle the proper introduction to tonight's reading that she deserves. So thanks everyone and Devin, take it away. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, so before I begin, which I'll actually hit this already, but I'm going to again, uh, take the liberty of speaking for all of us here at the Writer's House and especially those of us in the Writer's House seminar in expressing our fervent gratitude, Chef, um, to you for your willingness to spend time with us, getting to the weeds on style and prose and form and content, the frustrations of the editing process and um, the blood and the bones of life as a writer. And now uh, a little bit on why I care about Gabrielle Hamilton and her writing and why you should too. I was at one time reckoning with the transition from broke and down on my luck line cook, couch surfing through community college with the entirety of my possessions in the trunk of a 2014 Ford Fiesta to studying creative writing at a university where I, in fact, found an actual castle outside of my window. I struggled to reconcile what had been with what was presently. And so I scoured the internet and the library and what felt like the entire planet in search of a reflection or any trace of a life lived that could point my disoriented self toward some recognizable end. That was when I discovered blood, bones, and butter, the inadvertent education of a reluctant chef, emphasis on reluctant, by Gabrielle Hamilton. In chef, Ham in chef Hamilton's memoir, I found the voice of a fellow Scorpio, first and foremost, who also found the production of a Saturday night service to be the greatest show on earth. I found the story of a person that understood hospitality because they understood hunger. Someone that had suffered, celebrated, and survived in the walk-ins and dish pits of catering kitchens and neighborhood bars. A voice that echoed my own discontent with the pretentious academic world and shared my naive and romantic notion of the sanctuary that a restaurant can be and the family that can, be, that can be made therein if it is built with love and tended to with persistent, gentle diligence. I found someone that had inadvertently piecemealed together, scrambling at times, a cathedral, an unlikely fantastic triumph over an unconventional childhood. That said, the thematic contents of this text are not what initially drew me in. Gabrielle Hamilton's writing is just so damn good. <laughs> Blood, Bones, and Butter is a masterclass in and of itself on the craft of writing. In the book's opening passages, Hamilton invites us to the yearly party that her parents host in the backyard of her childhood home. Her house she describes as not really a house at all, but a wild castle built into the burnt out ruins of a 19th century silk mill. Her backyard, she writes, is not a regular yard, but a, but a meandering meadow with a creek running through it and wild geese living in it. When she describes the way her family cooled wine bottles in that frigid stream the hot coals and sizzling droplets of blood dripping from whole lambs spit roasted over an open fire and how the kids played tossing glow in the dark frisbees in the night. Gabrielle's complex sentences flow and bend in a measured rhythm that meander alongside the very creek she describes. This narrative of innocence and romance with which the book opens is in short order supplanted by a struggle for survival and unwittingly 
a lifelong endeavor to recapture the innocence, the, in the essence of what was lost. It's a search that goes beyond nostalgic notions of childhood or authentic cuisine. Today, her restaurant carries the very name by which her parents addressed her as a child, Prune. And, in, and so in birthing a restaurant with her own name, Gabrielle has gifted herself the opportunity to reestablish her eye, a chance to remake the world in her own vision. And in that vision, nourishment, attentiveness and care takes center stage. So it is through the spirit of romance, spectacle and hospitality as sanctuary that her prose carries that we ourselves can find inspiration and permission to use food and language and food as language to create beauty where none exists, to be generous beyond our means and to try to change one small corner of the world at a time, simply by cooking for people we love. Because love is the heart of what she does and what she writes, the sessions in which we in the Writer's House Seminar have discussed her writing and ideas have been positively intense, emotional, exciting, and challenging. It is my profound honor and privilege to introduce our final Ryers House Fellow of 2021, Gabrielle Hamilton. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Devin. Wow. Any words, Gabrielle? I'm like, <laughs> it's the best review I've ever gotten. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's it's gonna like, blush. And I don't mean the review, it's like the best read. I, I swear, like no one has gotten it as well as you got it. Oh. What prune means, it's like a total trying to recreate what I lost and it's so good. Thank you so much. I feel so seen and known. <laughs> Thank you, Devin. And maybe you'll send the text to that to Gabrielle. We'll get you connected. Thank you, Devin. And thank you, Lily. Right. Thank you so much. Gabrielle, we're gonna we're gonna turn to some passages um, that we have um, discussed your reading, and I think the idea would be you'll read some passages, and then you and I will talk about them briefly, and then we'll go on to the next, and so it'll be a kind of modified reading. Um, and the first passage that we've picked out, or that I picked out, and you consented to read, is from an essay. I've printed it out, so it's kind of weird holding it up like this from the New York Times Magazine. Everybody's read it. My restaurant was my life for 20 years. Does the world need it anymore? And the passage that I've asked you to read first is a few pages in, and it's a paragraph. For those of you following at home, it's a paragraph that begins, like most chefs. Would you read that and then we'll talk? I sure will. And um, will you forgive me if I screw up technologically, but I have this open on a tab on my computer and I'm going to go there and yeah. let's see what happens. Yeah, you might have to use control F to get to the passage. To come back to you, but yeah. did you, you're talking about, I meant to create a restaurant, that one? No, the earlier one, um, and we'll come back to that, but the earlier one, it starts like most chefs who own these small restaurants and it's a paragraph long. Well, <laughs> I have it right here, as I said I would. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <clears throat> and it ends with, they get ready for their shifts? Yes. And you just want me to read that? Sure, with pleasure. Okay. It's a lovely paragraph. And then I have, you know, I have things I want to ask you about from it. <laughs> Funny, sure. Okay, so like most chefs who own these small restaurants that have now proliferated across the whole city, I've been driven by the sensory, the human, the poetic and the profane, not by money or a thirst to expand. Even after seven nights a week for two decades, I am still stopped in my tracks every time my bartenders snap those metal lids onto the cocktail shakers and start rattling the ice like maracas. I still close my eyes for a second, 
taking a deep inhale every time the salted pistachios are set afire with rake, sending their anise scent through the dining room. I still thrill when the four top at table nine are talking to one another so contentedly that they don't notice they are the last diners, lingering in the cocoon of the wine and the few shards of dark chocolate we've put down with their check. Even though I can't quite take part in it myself, I'm the boss who must remain a little aloof from the crew. I still quietly thrum with satisfaction when the kids are chattering away and hugging one another their hellos and how are yous in the hallway as they get ready for their shifts. It's such a perfect Hamiltonian, forgive the adjective, paragraph, I think, Gabrielle, because it uses a, a a technique that you like, which is uh, parallel uh, sentences. You repeat the still, I still, I still, I still. And yet you're writing at a very dramatic and sad moment that you're closing down. And as you're closing down, you have to use language and memory and imagination to still feel, to still continue, still close your eyes still thrill that's i just i guess my all i wanted to do is say that is a fabulous use of still um and this is the essence of the relationship i think between writing and the restaurant so i wondered if we could just ponder on the use of still there i mean i it's it means for one thing continue to basic but what else does it mean? It's kind of an ongoing present. You still do, even as you read it just now, I think. Am I right about that? And what did it, you probably haven't reread this aloud since you wrote it a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, actually. What a year it's been. What are your thoughts about that, having reread it? It's so interesting to talk to a reader. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, I just meant to convey that um, I'm still ongoingly um, have my breath taken away yeah. by the work itself. And I wasn't tired and I wasn't finished and I hadn't become jaded and deadened to the, the work or the theater or the Right. sensory aspects um, in spite of decades, decades in the trenches of it, as well as needing to be fixated with the, um, not fixated, but equally attentive to the um, mechanics and architecture. So I don't, the word still, I have to think about it now that you're telling it to me, but I, I had only meant to say like, I am not dead. You're not dead. What goes on in this building, the yeah. heartbeat, the, the smells, the sounds, the, yeah. the life force. I'm not, I'm not just here like, well, how much is sea bass? Okay. So I buy it for this much a pound and okay. If we get four portions out of a, you know, it's like, does that make sense still? Yeah, still, and um, the vis writing in April 2020. So you are able to say, just as you're closing down, I still, after 20 years of prune, I still, I still, I close my eyes, I inhale, I'm stopped in my tracks. I love when the kids love each other on the staff. But here we are a year later and you're reading it. It's the power of words because you still, all of that is still happening in the prose well that is the power and magic of of language and what you can evoke um that's you're getting into like literary theory or linguistic theory no you're I, getting into it i have <laughs> no you really I, are because this is what, it. i did not <laughs> you do it all the time you do it all the time this is one thing that you do and i guess one last question then we'll turn to the next passage which is the thrill of the of the foretop at table nine, they're talking. You said elsewhere that all you wanted to do was 
create a space where conversation could occur. And it's not a direct quote, but paraphrased. And you really are thrilled that these people don't realize really it is time to go and we really need to clean up and close up. Yeah, and you thrill, that's a big word. Have you never been there? Yes. And when, when they let you have it? Yes. And, and then you, you sort of come to and you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, it's just like letting it's like letting your child finish its nap in the back of the car or like I'm, maybe that's not a good analogy but no it's a great analogy you know why it's a great analogy just because you need to be on your like dinners at 5 30 for this child it's like let the kid finish its nap as the car was driving home and that's what it looks like when the people are sitting at table four or nine and they are, they're in their little cocoon and it's, it's created by, yes, for sure, a little film of wine. <laughs> yeah, cocoon of wine. Brain. But it has that, we create for them that experience of sort of walking the perimeter. Yeah. And uh, you know that you sitting by the campfire are safe and we are the sentinels and we'll just be over here wiping down a counter and you know, putting away with saran wrap all of our mise en place for the night. We're quiet. We don't want you to, like, you don't want someone walking through like emptying the ashtrays because then you know exactly. the party's over. We've so, all been there and this is the opposite of that. And okay. when you put the chocolate down with the check, you're not, you're, you actually are saying, well, there's more to go. You guys can keep talking, right? That's right. You're, you, the spontaneous um, sociality of the space of this small restaurant can go on. And then in the passage, back to the theory, in the passage, it's still going on. The conversation is still taking place. People around the world are watching this YouTube and they're listening to us talk about it's still happening. It's still happening. And I would say that the cocoon is not a loose word. I mean, you you know what happens inside the cocoon and that's what happens when people meet at a table and talk and who knows what births and ideas and new things happen through that communion. Right. And we on the outside, when you see a cocoon, you, you don't like drive your truck. <laughs> <by it. laughs> no, I, I think that's part of hospitality is that you want to take care of that. And when you said the baby is still sleeping, it's a little far fetched because we don't. Yeah. The, people at the, people, people, the four people at table nine are like, not babies and they're not asleep, but still there is that tenderness. The cocoon of wine is, it's a thing to, it's a place to crawl into. And you didn't expect this conversation to go so far. And Prune made it happen. And you're, th and you thrill at that. And I just mean to be hospitable is to not, um, Look, what are we here for if we're in this work? Um, are you here for me? I think the way it's supposed to work is I said I would come here and do this for you. I will cook and clean and create the conditions for you. Not, um, hey, if you could just pay the check, um, I gotta right. go, I got paperwork I gotta do. And I agreed to stand Sentinel yeah. at the, you know, wall of the city <laughs> so that you can have this time to sit here and enjoy yourself and let your guard down and talk to each other and etc. So there's no elemental in that. That's I don't the yeah. child sleeping in the nap is too in the back seat is I didn't mean it about the child. I meant yeah. don't interrupt the nap. Let the right. something delicious about oh wow, I just got a good nap in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not about, as you've said many times, it's not about the food it's, uh, exclusively. It is elemental. It's the same Gabrielle Hamilton who, after those summertime ritualistic parties with the big fire, still hankers, I think, every summer to go somewhere where you can build a big fire and stand around it. Well, Prune, you couldn't start a fire there because probably it would violate code. But that's essentially what you're doing. 
you're building a fire and to see who stands around it and looks into the fire and has great thoughts. Listen, it, I've probably, it's, there's no secret that I'm filled with un, <laughs> unresolved psychological problems, <laughs> and <laughs> total, you know, sick pathologies that it's just like, please, can I return to what oh. I lost and what was taken away from me prematurely? <laughs> yeah, you did respond to Devin's mention of that in the introduction. Well, the, actually, this is the perfect transition because now we're talking, we're going to talk about mom. <laughs> Okay, this is a passage from Blood, Bones, and Butter. It's on the bottom of 22, for those following at home in their own hymnals, from um, 22 to, you know, the end of 23. And this is this great moment where the, your parents' marriage is it, the first signs of it falling apart, but now you go back and you remember the good stuff and you remember going with your mom to pick up the milk. Until this moment, more or less, I sat in her lap after dinner every single night. For a period, I was too young for after dinner chores, clearing, washing, drying, and possibly too favored. And so I eagerly crawled up and took my place in her lap, barefoot and drowsy. I leaned back into her soft body and listened to the gurgling as she chewed and swallowed. I breathed in her exhale, wine, vinaigrette, tangerine, cigarette smoke. While all of the others were excused from the table, I got to sit alone with my mother and father as they finished. I watched her oily lips, her crooked teeth, and felt the treble of her voice down my spine while she had adult conversation and gently rested her chin on the top of my head. She cracked walnuts from the Perigord and picked out the meats, extinguished her occasional cigarette in the empty broken husks, shifted my weight in her lap, she squeezed the tangerine peel into the candle flame and we watched the oils ignite in yellow and blue sparks. I sat in that woman's apron lap every single night of my young life, so close to the sounds and smells of her that I still know her body as if it were my own. I went everywhere she went, in the car, in the woods, in the market, in the kitchen. She took me to the farm to get our milk as only a French woman can in a heel, a silk scarf, and a cashmere skirt. She'd pull up the long driveway of the dairy farm in her chocolate brown antique Mercedes Benz, and without a single awkward gesture, get down and fill four rinsed out gallon plastic jugs with raw milk from a stainless steel tank, while 40 woolly Holsteins chewed and pissed in the overhumid next room. We left our money in the honor system coffee can, and I sat in the back of that old car while she struggled with the mechanics of a shifter on the steering column, but no clutch on the floor, and inhaled as deeply as I could the stink of the farm and the cow shit that lingered on our skin. I still very much like that smell of manure. I like it in my food and my wine and even in certain body odor. That milk was so thick and shitty that the cream separated and rose to the top and we siphoned off three inches from every gallon of milk we brought home. My mom used a turkey baster to extract the cream and she kept it separate in a jar in the fridge. This entire errand she could run effortlessly in suede heels. Gabrielle, shittiness is not negative for you. I mean, that is really, that's not a typical view. <laughs> and that is kind of the, it's almost your art right there in some. Um, shittiness is not negative. You, no, you you like you actually say it. you're a you're a chef. You say I like it in my food, right? And that is really. Can you say a little bit about the shittiness that's so good? Because there's shittiness in the writing too, which of course we're going to get to. Yeah, in in certain foods, of course, there's that. You know, they speak of it in certain wines and of of wet saddle and. Um, barnyard. Right. Uh, you can taste it in certain, like when you eat uh, suckling pig, there's a certain urine. I know we're talking about shit, but, yeah. <laughs> but all of the sort of funks of the barnyard or of um, <laughs> ripening, of maturity, of uh, decay, I guess, um, and life, actually. And life. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 they just, they're flavors that, that we were taught to love, I guess. And I, I still surely do. 
more than more than I think what they call them now are sort of insipid flavors, which is kind of a strong word to use for certain foods. But I think you know what I mean. Anything that's sort of super round and super easy, and um, I'm definitely yeah. attracted to things that are a little. You, um, this comes back. It's a kind of theme for you when you're on the Greek island and you're wandering around, you spent a few months there when you're 19 or 20, and you talk about the chamomile, mint, capers, oregano, thyme, figs, lemon, oranges. You're walking around the hills and you must be with your feet stirring up all those smells, right? And then on the goat paths, what do we find? Shine, this is a quote, shiny black licorice, that's a metaphor, shiny black licorice, jelly bean, goat poops. That is a string of shitty nouns. This is so fun for me. I have not ever spent any time <laughs> anyone who's re reading me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like- You I'm, should spend I, more time with your readers. I do, well, I didn't realize that I put so much shit in the There's book. There's a lot of, I mean, <laughs> you are making that, you make shitty food, in this case, goat poops, but you're associating that island with great food. You're making all that kind of ashes to ashes, dust to dust quality of growth and stuff we eat into black licorice and jelly beans. Who wouldn't want to eat the goat, goat poops after that? Look, things just, it's impossible for me. I don't know how to live any other way, but I happen to notice the kind of, um, um, dark, shitty <laughs> things that are in astonishing proximity to the most lavishly beautiful things. Yes. And I don't know why I am constantly seeing yes. the bright sunshine as well as the dark shadow side or the backside of the moon yeah. simultaneously. And yeah. It blows my mind how the, the the two sides of the fabric yes. just appear to me all the time. Like, oh, here's the plush velour front and wait, here's the rough backing. And yeah. I don't have to turn it over. And, and I'm not making this up. I'm just saying like, oh, I'm walking yeah. in the beautiful hills of, of this Greek island and uh, my feet are crushing truly wild oregano and marjoram and mint and the 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 wind is coming off the Aegean and it's blowing this right up my freaking nostrils. I'm like, right. this is unreal what my steps are releasing into the air. And I'm looking down and I'm like, oh, those looks like little black, <laughs> black licorice jelly beans. And that's because the goats are wandering up it's there. It's almost like a, a menu. I didn't make that up. I just was there. <laughs> so now, I mean, so I'm not your shrink or anything, but this all, <laughs> <laughs> but you can't this, be. All, this all occurs you introduce this whole i don't want i i, I want to call it like the antithetical sense of primal food words it's it both is heavenly and shitty it is both soaring and earthy right and this is all in the context of your mom not to be psychoanalytic too much but your mom getting milk with you shitty milk and you had to go with her and here's what you breathe in at the beginning of the passage. Her exhale as you're on her lap, wine, vinaigrette, tangerines, and cigarette smoke. That's your mom in a shitty smell. God, this is, this is the greatest psychotherapy session I've ever had. <laughs> and I don't know what you charge, but I'll, uh, ven I'll Venmo you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> That is a great passage because I think you're you're in chapter two, but it might as well it might as well be chapter one. You are setting the stage for the relationship, which is both heavenly and horrifying with yeah. your mom. Yeah, that's the, that's that's what we're trying to do to sort of yeah. let you know what's coming and um, yeah, and you totally know what you're doing there, and yet there's certain things about it you just admitted that you you kind of did as a writer, and now that we're ten years from 10 years later or whatever, we're, we're getting around to looking at word after word. It is just as, it is as allegorical almost 
a thing for a girl coming of age as it could possibly be. It is so fantastic. And that we're the same. I know her, her, the sounds of her body like my own. And, you know, by the end of the book, I, I haven't spoken to her in 20 years or 30 exactly. years. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have some negative things to say about her right there, even in that chapter. You don't even have, we don't even have to wait to find out that she's kind of an ass or a shithole or whatever it is that you, you use. You, yeah, it's kind of early. You, you're mad at her. You, you indicate early that you're, you, but this is just so evocative. Are you ready to read the long section about your visit to Marie Noel's? Um, this is this, she's, you're in Normandy, right? I'm in Brittany. Brittany, right? And she has a creperie and a sports bar. Mm -hmm. And this is a longish passage. So what folks watching us be prepared for a longer passage than the others. And, and then we'll talk about the end of it, but it's so evocative and beautiful. It begins for those following at home on 123. I'll just speed read so we can go very quickly. Okay. That's <laughs> teasing. Um, okay, so Mary Noel. Um, she put me to work at the bar at first, pulling espresso and steaming milk. She introduced me to one of the stout and ruddy complexion farmers. And as we shook hands, his rough and calloused clasping mine, I said, bonjour, Roger. And Roger bowed slightly and said, enchanté, mademoiselle, revealing his brown teeth. Marie Noel taught me how to pour his little ballon of vin rouge ordinaire with a good splash of water in it because at 8.30 in the morning, he and all of the other blue clad men with terrible teeth who now stood against the bar with manure and red dirt stuck to their black rubber boots were on their first of many to follow. Throughout the day, they would stop back in for a coup while their tractor sat haphazardly parked on the side of the road just outside. Bottles of Pernod, Ricard, and my favorite, the bitter orange flavored Suze hung upside down from a clever rack and I learned to push the glass up against the spring fitted nozzle to drain out a perfect one ounce pour. The eggs sat out at room temperature in the kitchen and Michel, the curry cook, who wore big thick lens glasses that made his eyes huge above his mustache, let the cigarette dangle from his lips as he cracked them into the crepe batter, made of buckwheat flour each day. The salad dressing was made in the bottom of the bowl with garlic, mustard, vinegar, and oil and tossed in with the bib lettuce that we bought at the little open air market that set up every morning across the street. I stood often with Marino at her post at the cash register and sold lottery tickets, Gitan, Galois, and Rothman Rouge by the carton. And from the register, I could look straight into the Capri where Michelle spooned out the batter onto the oversized black turntable griddle and then swirled his little dowel of a baton around like a DJ scratching the beat. He was decisive and swift, and he cracked the egg right onto the galette and sprinkled the grated gruyere and laid out a slice of that jambon with the white fat cap over and over again, working the two griddles effortlessly. To finish and plate each galette, he used his metal spatula to fold in the four sides, forming a square from a circle with the contents exposed to at the center, and deftly ran the spatula under the savory crepe, delivering it to the plate, et voila, he said each time, and then turned to the next. That meal with the salad right on top of the complet and a bottle of the hard cider kept at truly cellar temperature in an actual cellar was one I ate every day without ever getting bored with it. I had never before given a single thought to how different the lettuces and the cider and even the butter, bread and eggs tasted when left at room temperature and never refrigerated, but now I was keenly aware of it. For the duration of the winter, I hibernated inside her warm little hub of life in that tiny village and earned a few francs by working every day in the bar or the crippery or at the cash register selling cigarettes and lottery tickets. I fixated on the local shops the boulangerie, poissonerie, boucherie, fromagerie, and pâtisserie, and how they displayed their foods in that careful, precise, and focused way that never, in spite of all that precision and care, looked rigid or antiseptic or strained. Every piece of food in every store, no matter how artful, precise, and often jewel-like, begged to be touched, smelled, and heartily eaten. We bought bread at the bread store, meat at the meat store, dry goods at the dry goods store, 
there was a huge supermarket they, that had just been built at the edges of the town. But when we went there to get something in bulk supply for the bar or crepery, Marie Noel kind of smiled sheepishly and moved quickly across the parking lot to the car. In town at the local boucherie though, the rabbits and pheasants and geese were displayed in the cases with some remnant of their living life still with them. The geese were laid out with their long necks arranged in great question mark arcs around their totally plucked bodies as if they were not dead, but simply deep in sleep. Their black beaks and faces nestled in striking contrast to their bare creamy bodies. The rabbits looked like clipped show poodles wearing fuzzy slippers, otherwise skinned, but their furry feet left intact while their little bloody faces revealed their tiny bloody teeth. Pheasants in full stunning plumage hung for a few days until their necks finally gave out and you could see physically a kind of perfect ripeness to the meat when it became tender enough to pleasurably chew as if the earliest stage of rot itself was a cooking technique. Boudin Blanc and Boudin Noir overran the charcuterie and tatsur cases as Christmas and New Year and Saints days in the deep of winter demanded these traditional foods made only at this time of year when animals are slaughtered, not bred. Young cooks who desired to be chefs went to auberge in the countryside of France and slept on cots and worked without pay for 16 hours a day, six days a week. They did these apprenticeships called stages, which I had never heard of until well after I'd opened my own restaurant. Of course, I had never worked anywhere in my life where young people apprenticed for free in hopes of learning something valuable. The canal house and the picnic basket and mothers were the kinds of restaurants where the only thing that mattered to anyone was their paycheck, their tips, and their free shift drink. People who knew about staging were French boys on the cusp of manhood who lived in France and spoke English and spoke French. And when they were 14 and clearly not cut out for the books at their lycée, would wander down the road to their local two-star inn and tap on the screen door of the kitchen there. They joined, at the bottom, the ranks of a brigade kitchen and did their little part learning how to be clean, fast, efficient, and perfectly repetitive. They plucked the feathers from partridges that arrived through the back doors of the kitchens. They quickly washed berries picked by local men and women from their own bushes. They scrubbed copper as punishments. I knew nothing of it, not one detail. I didn't even know such an apprenticeship existed or that anyone would aspire to such a thing. I was clearly in no two-star country auberge. The locals, Riton and Andre and Yannick, all of them strangely cross-eyed, chain-smoking, semi-literate drunks, leaned too many days a week and too many hours a day against that bar where I was understanding for the first time the chasm between coffee ground to order per cupful and what I'd slurped every morning from Dimitri with my egg on a roll, which came out of a stainless steel tank. The patrons and crew of our little sports bar, Cum Crepri, on that gray corner in that drab small town resembled nothing of the fine dining clientele of a two-star Relais and Chateau Inn, nor its brigade. Michel, always in street clothes with the same apron used for the whole work week, unwashed, smoking while mixing crepe batter, and Marie Noel nervously sipping her tisanes to calm her ever since her husband Eve had offed himself and the barmaid Sylvie with her long black hair rarely washed and never pulled back, who seemed to know just the right time to pour a free round and who very warmly received the flirtations of the cross-eyed, toothless, shit-stinking admirers, resembled not one aspect of a toped brigade meticulously fluting mushroom caps. Nonetheless, everyone had an opinion about the baguette at breakfast and everyone knew how to prepare a simple roast chicken and a few potatoes cooked in the local heavily salted butter. Everyone casually tipped the last sip of the red wine from their glass into their dish of soup and mopped it all up with the crusty heel left in the bread basket. I was sucking something in, something unmitigated. This is the crepe. This is the cider. This is how we live and eat. This man with bits of straw stuck to his thick blue Breton sweater, leaning a gum up against the bar for a ballon of vin rouge ordinaire with a splash of water in it at 8.30 in the morning is the farmer whose milk we have been drinking, whose leeks we have been braising. These are the naughty, wormy, quite small apples from which the cider is made. And here, as a treat to celebrate my last day before continuing on my journey, 
when we drove to the coast, past fields of shooting asparagus and trees about to burst forth, and we stopped finally at the water's edge in Saint Malo. Here are the platters of shellfish pulled that very morning from the sea. Langouste, langoustine, moule, crevette, wheat, boulot, bigorneau, cook. These are the pearl-tipped hat pins stuck into a wine bottle cork for pulling out the meats of the sea snails. The tide ran out and the fishing boats slumped in the mud attached to their slack anchors like leashed dogs sleeping in the yard. The particular smell of sea mud went up our nostrils as we slurped the brine from the shells in front of us, so expertly and neatly arranged on the tiers. Chin Chin, Rino and I saluted each other, celebrating these past few months and clinked together our glasses of Muscadet Sur Lee. Thank you, Gabrielle. Wow, what a passage. You knew you were writing poetry, so you had to lineate the damn thing, you know? <laughs> This is the crepe, new paragraph, new stanza. This is the cider. So you chose a two word sentence to start that poetic passage, something unmitigated. We really should talk about the word unmitigated for a second. Wow, that was a bit of a surprise and yet it means so much. What's your take on that? You know what we, are always doing with the food and maybe with the writing too, is like we're dressing everything up and we're making everything um, with a lot of fuss and presentation and altering its, its true nature in many ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Italians are very different in that way, <laughs> typically that they, they like to showcase and accentuate the nature of what they're cooking. And this, this town was just, um, it was all about the spotted apples that were just knotted and wormy and they made delicious hard cider and not just this town, but this type of life. And there was no, um, song and dance. There was no, let's flambe it and um, refine it. Yeah. It was unmitigated in that way. I love how you use unmitigated. You could have said simple, truthful, basic, mm. clarified, but you said unmitigated because the opposite is the thing that you hate so much about the food business. That's mitigation. Why mitigate this Again, there's a lot of shit in this passage too. Did you notice? Well, it's funny, you know, that if <laughs> it's not, I don't really hate anything, but I will say that um, what makes me very nervous, very uncomfortable in life is pretension. In, and it can be in any direction. I think people think of pretension as someone putting on sort of high end airs, but I consider pretension in any direction, just pretending that what I see in front of me is not what I see and that you are right. gonna tell me that it's something different. And I, I don't know, I just sort of like, mm, I smell shit. <laughs> so, and I don't, it doesn't have to be bad. Like as a person who loves shit, just please don't sure. put perfume on the poop. That's right. work speaking. And so, um, and in fact, sometimes those, those I guess let's just talk about food because I don't know if I can do about it, speak of it in metaphor or literally, but, but actually I can just in terms of writing, I just think like why, as they say, use the, the $20 word when there's a very sturdy $5 word that will get the job done, if not better than the $20 word. And when you put the $20 word in where a $5 one will work, um, I think you're saying some, I think what you want is for me to smell your perfume. Does that make sense? Yes. And so. So what happens here in this passage, I think, is you tell this great story about Mary Noe's amazing setup and you're learning a lot and you're dealing with these cross-eyed, toothless, shit stinking admirers, but they're still admirers and they love this place. And then you suck it in because this is your experience. It's going to turn into actual menu items in your restaurant later. 
And then you say something unmitigated, which is not even a full sentence, I mean, grammatically. And then this beautiful thing where the simplest word, this, gets repeated. This, 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 these, here, here, these. You are doing something that language only can do. You're, it's indexical. You're pointing to the thing. This is the crepe, as if, as if I reading this, I've never been to Brittany. I've never had one of these crepes, but I got it because you said this is the crepe. This is the cider. You're pointing to it. It's real. The words are pointing to something real in the language. But does it, it's interesting because what I would say is that the mitigated experience is when, like, for example, you would have the sommelier arrive and say, now here we have the cider, or you would have the <laughs> captain of the table come and say, <laughs> now we recommend, you know, that you yes. this first and um, that, and it's such a mitigated experience and it's, right. it's being curated for me by this steward or this custodian of the experience. Yes. And I hope, or what I'd hoped to do for you on this page here is not to let me tell you. <laughs> no, the opposite. So, I just wanted to bring it home for you. Like this, this. Yes. To, there's to a real this, and there's a real here, and then there's a fake this and a fake here. You learned this. You almost it, yes. you probably could have italicized it. This, this thing oh, really yeah. is the thing. This is the cider, and then, then you give us the most beautiful two sentences, which are full of monosyllables. I don't dare do this often, but I'm actually gonna read it back to you. I want you to hear the monosyllables of the last key sentences. Of course, chin chin is the last part, but just prior to that, listen to the thisness of this. The tide ran out. It's almost like back to the, back to the beginning of language, right? To, back to the sea. The tide ran out and the fishing boats slumped in the mud, attached to their slack anchors like leashed dogs sleeping in the yard. The particular smell of sea mud went up our nostrils as we slurped the brine from the shells in front of us so expertly and neatly arranged on the tiers. That is real writing, if I may, that's beautiful writing. And it got earned with this discovery of thisness, I think, it's just lovely. The sound of those words. Poetic. I don't know. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for writing it. It's so we're gonna go to our next passage, which is, there are two more. And the next one is um, from my favorite of Can your just, New York Times pieces. Uh, this, I just want to say one thing. Yes. It, it's occurring to me is that I think, um, I think this happens in, in food all the time. And I think it may happen in writing and literature as well. Yeah. Which is that we are quoting and um, plagiarizing, maybe, unwittingly, or mm. um, do you even know who you're quoting when you're quoting? Or when you go and you're going to make um, a galette, you know, the Saracen, these these buckwheat crepes, let's call yes. them, even though yeah. this, everyone's are galettes, but, um, or you're going to make a hard cider, and you're like in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and you're like, <laughs> you're like, ooh, you know what would be really cool is like some hard cider. Like, that's so great, but it would be so good if you knew uh, what it was meant to be or how it started. Not that we shouldn't innovate and keep going and make new things, but sometimes you lose what the uh, <laughs> burning strong ember was and you start to riff and um, make new things. And that's why I'm like, this is the crepe. Yes. Now we can go on and right. we can put um, pine nuts and we can yeah. go ahead and make crepes that put, I don't know, mango puree in there, but just 
just know this one before, I guess it's a little bit like saying, please know the, uh, the rules of the craft before you yes. break them, because then you'll break them very well. And when you create something new and. What you have done, it's the birth of the chef, the birth of the cook is there. The birth of the person goes back to chapter one, to the ritual parties and that whole familial thing. The birth of the person who cares about food is spending time with Marie Noel and realizing what is so basic. And literally the two of you, I mean, you couldn't have, you can't make this shit up. This is, this happened, this is right. You know what I'm saying? This is real. This is not fiction. You went to the sea with her at the end of the experience as if, okay, we did some origin stuff, but now we're really going to do some origin stuff. Let's go to the sea. And then you do the monosyllables with all the S's and the B, BRs, the brines. You're like soaking in origin there. And it's completely and utterly lovely. It's poetry. That's why you did the poetry thing. Your editor didn't say, what the heck? Your copy editor didn't say, why are you doing poetry here? Probably not. You know, the, the, the fun thing about <laughs> all the rules is there's really only one fucking rule. <laughs> and that is, are you getting away with it? And I don't mean getting, like, is it working? Because, you know, you can study all the rules of the craft and you can like, oh, there, you don't start sentences with the word and, obviously. I mean, except in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> except but, that you know, origin. <laughs> I mean, if you listen, right, if you like dutifully, obligatorily follow all the rules, all the rules of writing that you've heard, um, your economy of sentences and don't yeah. do this and don't do that and yeah. show me, don't tell me and kill your yeah. darlings, et cetera. And, right. and um, show, don't tell, et cetera. And, and you can follow all of them and your prose is dead on the page. But the only right. rule is, did my editor just read it and be like, works for me <laughs> works for you is that's a delightful thing so you know <laughs> tomorrow one of my questions we're not going to do it tonight tomorrow one of my questions is going to be about the beginning of that trip when you were 19 that long trip really not just europe but everywhere um it began with um depression and you know sort of vaguely you talk about suicidal thoughts and then you decide that europe would be a way to disappear yourself which is an alternative to suicide, but much healthier, although, although it was difficult. And that is the preface to going to Amsterdam, having the re revelation with the Gouda and the boiled potato, and then this, the thing you just read. And that has to be in the context of going real, real low in order to realize there's, I'm gonna cry, because there's, in order to realize there's something really basic and good. I mean, Marie Noel, her husband had just committed suicide, right? And you were there and you just learned how you survive, I guess, from these people. It's a, it's just in context, I guess I recommend to everyone that they read the book and, and get that whole chapter. That is chapter eight, which is beautifully framed. Um, it's you deciding, well, prune, this thing is more shit, rat shit. Uh, this, this space here, I'm, I'm going to do it. And then you have this long, long uh, memory of the trip. <laughs> I mean, it's a, anyway, fundamental stuff. Okay, next passage. This is my favorite piece. Um, real people eat quiche. Okay. And this, I'm asking you to read the last few paragraphs of this piece from the New York Times, November 21st, 2018. And I believe that this is your this is your statement about this is your life statement. <laughs> I think this is so beautiful. I'm looking at the passage at the end of this piece that's called, and that's the thing about stupid quiche. Do you have that one? I really do. And you okay. want me to read that. Can't wait to hear it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you want me to take that one to the end? Yes, yeah. please. Well, and that's the thing about stupid quiche. Rubbery, cold, thick, heavy, soggy, banal, underwhelming, ridiculous quiche. <laughs> it's only so if you don't attend to the work of it, if you set it and forget it. I am lucky in that I like work more than I like food. 
for a chef, this may sound pitiable, but happily restaurant life is about work, about making the food, not consuming it. Every dish we cook, we send out to someone else. It's as if we are midwives to children we will not hold. We may or may not love children, but we love midwifery. We love the boiling of the water and the getting of the towels and the wiping down the surfaces. I know that there is very little argument left for doing it the hard way, and I might be its last champion on earth. My slogans are the worst. The harder, the better. If it's easy, it stinks. But I pull out the aphorisms that worked for me when I was 19 and hope they still have traction with the 19 year old who is standing across from me at the prep table. If all the cream rises to the top, what happens to the milk? What does the man do before enlightenment, I ask? Quoting some Zen proverb from my own youth, he chops wood and hauls water. And what does he do after enlightenment? He chops wood and hauls water. I'm not sure this lands. Are we laying stone or building a cathedral people? I'm making the case for building the tart step by arduous step, stone by stone with a song in your heart. I go full bore about the bricklayers, that ultra cheesy motivational story about some visitors who arrive in a foreign city and meet a man on his knees with his masonry tools. He's sweating and grimacing and they ask him what he's doing and he says, I'm laying stone. And they see another man on his knees up ahead with his masonry tools. And he says, I'm building a wall. I got a wife and kids and bills to pay, man. <laughs> and they come upon the next guy on his knees with his masonry tools and he's whistling and aglow with a song in his heart. And he says, me? I'm building a cathedral. And there you have it, the quiche, now drafted into the service of my own cultural war against shortcuts and half measures. While back upstairs, the guests have arrived for lunch and it turns out they order the quiche. Masterful, that's so great. And you, this is you, right? This is your whole thing. Work, <laughs> make it work more than food, chop wood and haul water and you'll get enlightenment. Well, it's, once you are enlightened, you still have to chop the wood and haul the water, but it sure <laughs> makes the task uh, more more pleasant and more interesting. All the more reason for people to um, be in the English department at your school, in my opinion, because people think it's, you know, this, mis this misperception that, I'm sorry, I'm going to learn English. It's like, no, you're getting a liberal arts education, which enlightens your freaking mind, which makes the bricklaying that you're going to do in life later a lot more palatable and it makes you more palatable frankly to me because i'm going to be laying brick next to you and if we're going to lay brick together for 14 hours i sure fucking hope you read a book <laughs> holy cow you just drafted the, un the liberal arts education into the service of your culture war that was well done that was well done you know the writing of this is magnificent you you mix the metaphors. In the middle of the bricklayer story, you use the word ultra cheesy, which of course, it's quiche. I mean, that was just a sly move. And then, and there, there's another word there, this, here, and there you have it, comma, the quiche. <laughs> I like to go high low. You know, you gotta, you gotta put a little <laughs> cathedral and ultra cheesy in there. That is really fantastic. So, I'm not sure this lands, you say. You ever read Roger Angel's essays in The New Yorker? Possibly, sure. yeah. Just, this is angel-like. This is that good. Um, he, he'll pause and say, I'm making, a, this is an uphill argument, and he'll remind you that it is. And I'm not sure this lands is a spectacular way of doing that. Are we laying stone or building cathedral, people? There's so much passion here, Gabrielle. Well, you know, my, my work... <laughs> over the years has is it, it's morphed and with the sort of new population of the workforce of you got to teach people what it is to be alive or what work means or if there's value in this work and I think you know the the particularly kitchen work um, it has attracted a very educated and um, privileged group of people, whereas it used to be left for people with no options and no choices. But what attracted them to it, I think was like Tony <laughs> Bourdain and everyone oh, thought like, I wanna be on a pirate ship too. Oh my God, 
that's, yeah, man, that sounds great. And I want to be a scalawag and be on the crew. And, um, but if you have a college education and your parents are doctors and you've decided to come and work in a kitchen, it's, it's quite an eye opener when you're like, wait, I could just go be at, you know, my parents' summer house. And mm. why do I need to do all of this work? And I just keep over the 20 years trying to say, you know, there's such beauty in a honest day's work and you can really build beautiful things if you take the time and we don't have to, everything doesn't have to be so fast or so cheap or so quick. And there's something to be said for, I don't know, learning a language, um, not on an app. Yeah. <laughs> by actually reading and writing the words down or so. And how, how worried are you about that 19 year old standing across from you at the prep table? I'm not worried about anything. I, I realize that my own anxieties, my own henny penny, the sky is falling is such my own crap and my own neurosis. And having met all the 19 and 21 year olds in my restaurant over the years, I'm like these golden gem people who mm -hmm. I love so much. And the ones in your class that I met today, all the way up to 28 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Devin. <laughs> Uh, everything is fine. Everything is fine there. I think it's the world is just, it's exactly like high school or elementary school all over again. I don't mean in the, uh, I just mean there's six people up front who are nailing it. There's four guys in the back, totally goofing off and who knows what's going to happen. And then the rest of us are just sort of hanging out in the middle. Mm. And that, is, that just seems like life. And once again, you did the analogy to uh, the college classroom and the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the end, so I'm holding this amazing book. Um, and at the end of it, you included a typewritten list of everyone who ever worked at Prune. Um, and that struck me as a wonderful gesture and a I don't know, a, an effort to imply the particular demo, uh, democratic feel of this particular tiny restaurant. There, I, I, you know, you could probably identify and tell stories about every one of those people. And they range from the, I could be at the summer house to I've got a family up in the Bronx, as you mentioned once, um, you know, and we're just struggling to get by everyone. The um, problem with the cookbook is that I wanted to be true to the form and I wanted it to be a cookbook and I, or a cooking book. And I noticed that the form of cookbook was getting a little strange mm. out in the world. And it was sort of like, is this a memoir uh, and a, an autobiography with recipes? And is it, and the head notes would just last forever. And, and in a little bit of a, um, uh, Whatever, I'm an asshole. I'm a bit of an asshole. So I'm just sort of like, if you want to write a fucking memoir, then put your ass on the line and write one. <laughs> and, oh. if you're, and if you're going to write a cookbook, then write a cookbook. And so <laughs> hmm. I couldn't uh, load the recipes or the pages up with all of that um, story and narrative, et cetera. Mm -hmm. However, it's, it's irrepressible in me. And if you read the cookbook, you know, with your... Right. <laughs> like right. there is so much narrative that I've hidden in there. And yes. if you read that employee manifest at the end of all of the names of the employees, yes. there are little notes and it's right. um, so and so is allergic to shellfish or this person doesn't like sweets. You'll see there's an English teacher there. Oh, yay. Which tells you a lot about my restaurant. Yeah. I, that there has always been an English teacher on staff. <laughs> you understand not, not like this is their part-time job as a as a porter, right. but they come to the restaurant to teach English to the people who work there, and they get everybody gets paid to learn English. Oh, that is cool. And look, you'll never know that. That's my own little. <laughs> oh, no, you well, a whole lot of people just heard it. But when you're when you're when you're looking at the payroll, you know, at your payroll register, and you have to put everyone in categories like front of house, back of house. It's like hmm. English teacher. Where is that? <laughs> Like what restaurant? So uh, getting back to the, 
cookbook for one sec. I, of course, read the uh, read the memoir several times and then arrived under bar snacks to the Gouda, that kind of sweaty Gouda, Gouda and the boiled potatoes just there you don't explain see my book there's a whole story here and i as a, a reader who had seen both i really enjoyed getting to that to that part because i felt like this this is an item on the menu that is full of passion but you don't have to know that in order for it to work well you know yeah that's the um you're this is like the greatest day of my life talking to you oh stop you're such an astute reader and you put you've made all the connections that there are to make that it's how oh, we were taught you. right you just thank you so much right to the highest mind and then you picked all that up and um you know people when i wrote my memoir they're like you should put some recipes in there and i was like <laughs> no <laughs> i want to like live or die <laughs> on the merits of the writing and yeah. not because you're like, ah, oh, the book sucks, but at least you get the, at least <laughs> the Bloody Mary recipe in there. There's plenty <laughs> of those. So we're going to end tonight with the ending of this New York Times Magazine piece from almost exactly a year ago. My restaurant was my life for 20 years. Um, this, as you know, cause you met with the students, this was a very powerful experience for us talking about this book because after I uh, talking about this piece, because after all, the students in the class, they've all been through the last year. They've all been adults since, you know, the, this is real to them. And the idea that you needed to, let's hope, temporarily abandon this project um, was devastating to them. So I'm going to ask you to read the final part of the piece. Um, no, actually, it's the... It's from I like I like hundreds of other chefs down to um, he pours right to the rim the chilled glass without spilling over. Okay. Unless you want to read all the way to the end, maybe read all the way to the end, and 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 we'll just conclude with that. I don't unless you really want to talk about this passion. I think it might be good just to end with it. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah. And I'll I'm going to plug, and again I'll plug 11 a.m. tomorrow Eastern time. We'll be back and we'll be doing Q and A. So. Gabrielle, will you? Yeah, and I just want to make sure that I end at the wrong, at the right spot, um, because I think okay, until without spilling over. Um, I like hundreds of other chefs across the city and thousands across the country are now staring down the question of what our restaurants, our careers, our lives might look like if we can even get them back. I don't know whom to follow or what to think. Everyone says, you should do to go. You should sell gift cards. You should offer delivery. You need a social media presence. You should pivot to groceries. You should raise your prices. A Branzino is $56 at Via Carota. I have thought for many long minutes, days, weeks of confinement and quarantine. Should I? Is that what Prune should do and what Prune should become? I cannot see myself excitedly daydreaming about the third party delivery ticket screen I will read orders from all evening. I cannot see myself sketching doodles of the to-go boxes I will pack my food into so that I can send it out into the night anonymously, hoping the poor delivery guy does a good job and stays safe. I don't think I can sit around dreaming up menus and cocktails and fantasizing about what would be on my playlist just to create something that people will order and receive and consume via an app. I started my restaurant as a place for people to talk to one another with a very decent but affordable glass of wine and an expertly prepared plate of simply braised lamb shoulder on the table to keep the conversation flowing and ran it as such as long as I could. If this kind of place is not relevant to society, then it, we, should become extinct. And yet, even with the gate indefinitely shut against the coronavirus, I've been dreaming again. But this time I'm not at home fantasizing about a restaurant I don't even yet have the keys to. This time I've been sitting still and silent inside the shuttered restaurant I already own that has another 10 years on the lease. I spend hours inside each day on a wooden chair in the empty clean space with the windows papered up. And I listen to the coolers hum, the compressor click on and off periodically 
the thunder that echoes up from the basement as the ice machine drops its periodic sheet of thick cubes into the isolated, insulated bin. My body has a thin blue thread of electricity coursing through it. Sometimes I rearrange the tables. For some reason, I can't see wanting deuces anymore. No more two tops? What will happen come Valentine's Day? It's no mystery why this prolonged isolation has made me find the tiny 24 square inch tables that I've been cramming my food and my customers into for 20 years suddenly repellent. I want round tables, big tables, six people tables, eight tops, early supper, home before midnight, long lingering civilized Sunday lunches with sun streaming in through the front French doors. I want old regulars to wander back into the kitchen while I lift the lids off the pots and show them what there is to eat. I want to bring to their tables small dishes of the feta cheese I've learned to make these long idle weeks with a few slices of the saucisson sec I've been hanging downstairs to cure while we wait to reopen. And to again hear Greg rattle the ice, shaking perfectly proportioned vespers that he pours right to the rim of the chilled glass without spilling over. Gabrielle Hamilton, thank you so much for this session. It's thank been you. completely marvelous. Me, um, thank you. We will be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. I want to thank Lily Applebaum, uh, who has coordinated Writers House Fellows, who's just the best, and Devin, who gave a fantastic introduction, and to Zach Cardner, who did the tech tonight. To all of you who watched on YouTube, please come back tomorrow. We will have the recording of this available and tomorrow, but it's better to do it live, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And you can find that on the Kelly Writers House YouTube page. And once more, Gabrielle Hamilton, thank you so much for this. This was fantastic. Good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>